Hi, this is Professor Cummings. And what we're looking at here is what's known as a progressive die. What you see is a series of dies and the dies are actually creating a part through a series of, well, progressive steps. A blank enters into the conveyor. The first die comes down, forms a certain level of the part. It moves over to the next die and it gets progressively changed until you end up with the final product. So it's a series of forming and shearing processes that are going on, going on in this whole process. So you can see it's made up of a punch and here you have a die and here you have a blank or what they're referring to as the cup in this one, but this is just a blank of, of the steel component. So you got a steel on steel on steel, all with, with different functions, all expected to perform a different task, and yet they're all still made from a very similar type of material. They're all made from steel. So my question to you on this particular video is this. What is the difference between the steel for the punch and the steel for the blank, the actual part? You know, stay tuned, keep watching this video, and I'll go over exactly what the difference is between the different types of steels, the different mechanical properties, and how those different mechanical properties are actually. All right, in a previous video, I spoke about how steel our metals in general solidify you know they start off as a molten liquid and as they cool down they form dentrites and as the dentrites which looks like snowflakes or ice crystals continue to grow as the metal starts to cool or continues to cool down it actually starts to form grains and that's pretty much where I left it before I started talking more about metal forming okay but let's stop at this point or let's let's go with this point a little bit more so we've got actual grains of iron here now if we were to look at this iron on a much more smaller level and just consider how the the iron atoms are actually structured what we end up with is something called a space lattice and the space lattice all that is is the structure for how iron atoms come together and they can come together in one of two general ways. One is a body-centered cubic formation. The other one is a face-centered cubic formation. And these are just different types of space lattices. You know, the space lattice, you have your iron atoms on the outside. Here at the four corners, or excuse me, eight corners in both cases. But in a body-centered cubic, you have an iron atom that takes up space in the middle. In a face-centered cubic, you have the iron atoms that move out towards, of course, the six faces. So what's the difference between a body-centered cubic and a face-centered cubic? There's a process called allotropy. Now, allotropy is what happens when an iron crystal actually goes across the transformation temperature. So what you're doing is you're actually heating up the iron to the point where you actually change the space lattice or the way the atoms come together so you have you are able to go from a body center cubic you excite the iron atom or the iron structure to the point where you actually cause the iron atoms to move out and you have a face centered cubic and what happens the difference between these two is not just the temperature you know due to allotropy or the allotropy which is that transformation it's also the fact that there's interstitial space within the body of this space lattice. So let's keep that in mind. So the body center cubic has less space, the face center cubic has more space, and the difference between the two is allotropy, which is just simply the transformation that takes place as you go above or below the transformation temperature, also known as the Curie temperature. Okay? Now, I want to go into another point that I'm going to try and tie these two together. Now, in another video, we had spoken about the influence of carbon on iron. And what we saw was down here at the lower end, when carbon is lowest, you have steel. That's between 0 and 
and this is much more ductile, a lot less brittle, not quite as hard, you know, easily formed. And as you increase the amount of iron, or excuse me, the amount of carbon that's in iron, you become more and more brittle, more and more hard, until you end up with a material called cementite, which is 6.67% carbon is within the iron, all right? What we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna focus in on this area here, on what goes on with steel. And more importantly, steel down here in this range at 0.8%. All this is steel between zero and 2%, but you know, I'm gonna be looking at just this particular area. This just would dictate back to our initial question as to what's the difference between the steel that's used to make the blank and the steel that's used to make the actual die, you know, as well as the punch and other different types of material like nails and other things. So we look at this difference in the amount of carbon in the steel, and we gotta consider how do you get more carbon into steel? Okay, well, when you look at this particular space lattice, the body at center cubic space lattice, it's actually able of holding a certain amount of iron, but it's only able, capable of holding up to 0.02% iron, 0.02% iron. Now, steel has two, up to 2%, you know, and then we got these other, great. so how do you get more iron into the steel? Well, that's where the transformation temperature comes into play. As you heat metal up, heat iron up, above its transformation temperature, it becomes again the space-centered cubic. And the space-centered cubic uh, structure is able of holding 2%. Now, one thing I wanted to keep in mind is there's an actual name for these two different types of grains of iron. One is ferrite. And at this stage, it's called austenite. Okay. And the difference between the two is, you know, ferrite is only capable of holding 0.02%. It's the body center cubic. You go across to the transformation temperature, and you're capable of holding 2% carbon as austenite. So now let's look at these two in terms of the amount of carbon as well as what goes on between or along this range. So if we look at the amount of carbon that's going from complete ferrite and cementite, the difference is the amount of carbon that's taking place. Now, keep in mind that ferrite is only capable of holding 0.02% carbon. All right, so it's from zero to 0.2%, 0 so not a whole lot. So what happens to that extra carbon as you go higher and higher? You know, what, what does it do within the grain structure of, of the iron or of the steel at this point? Well, the extra iron or the extra carbon actually comes out and it starts to form a laminated structure where it is ferrite. This is ferrite layered with cementite. Our iron carbide so layered with cementite and again it's a lamination of alternating layers between ferrite and cementite and anything above two percent will start to form a, per a new substance called perlite so this material or this new region is called perlite now the different levels of carbon dictates how much perlite is actually in the iron and that is where you start to see this difference in properties. So it's possible, depending on the amount of carbon that you have, that you will actually see these little regions of perlite within the grain structure. So different types of regions of perlite, you know, depending on how much carbon is inside the system or inside the, the, the space lattice. So now let's look at this same again. Well, let's alter this the axis here we got the percentage of carbon and we have a vertical axis that we're gonna see as temperature so down here at these lower temperatures you've got ferrite these upper temperatures you've got austenite and somewhere in here you're gonna have your transformation temperature 
okay I'm not gonna say exactly where it's at just yet but you're gonna have a transformation temperature and the reason that you can't just pinpoint and say this is the exact spot for the transformation temperature is because it is dictated by the amount of carbon that's within the system so you end up with something like this and this upper red line is the transformation temperature and as you can see the transformation temperature actually goes down with the more carbon that comes into the system okay so you can go from 1670 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to 1333 degrees Fahrenheit depending on the amount of carbon at up to 0.8 percent carbon still within the grades of, of certain types of steel okay so at one end you have ferrite where you can have as little as no carbon here in the middle you have cementite or excuse me perlite you know various mixtures so uh, ferrite because it can hold up to 0.02 percent and then anything extra becomes perlite or you can call it ferrite plus cementite sometimes it's called ferrite plus perlite you know alpha plus perlite so and this is also known as alpha alpha iron so and then you know here at the other end you have cementite now how does this iron that can be absorbed and held within 0.02 percent in ferrite travel throughout the, the grain is through a process known as diffusion and diffusion just simply means that the extra iron that can't be held by the ferrite as it cools down through the transformation temperature actually travels outside of the, the ferrite grain and it actually starts to form your perlite and that is the process known as diffusion so the carbon actually migrates in diffusion now this is not a fast process as the metal cools down depending on the size the total mass you know this can actually take quite a while but as it happens as it goes through the entire diffusion process you know the perlite gets formed now what is the impact of this remember the original question what is the difference between the steel that's used as the blank and the steel that's used as the die a steel that's used as the punch this is where all the mechanical properties come from it'll affect how well you're able to harden the material how well you're able to weld the material what the toughness of the material the ductility of the material so different types of carbon content can actually impact the application so the, the higher the amount of carbon the uh, harder and more brittle the material the lower the carbon the more ductile the material so it can affect not just you know the the mechanical properties in terms of what you use it for but as well as how you process it you know higher carbon materials have different needs when you go through the welding process they have different needs when they can be formed when they can be uh, uh, forged you know just because of the amount of carbon and because of the mechanical properties that you're working with so this is why you don't use the same steel to make a die that you would use to make a nail now we talked about the diffusion process and like I said the diffusion process is not necessarily a very fast process it actually can be very slow depending on the type of material you have but what happens if you speed it up what it happens if you don't let it take its natural course and just air cool instead you take it and you cool it very quickly either by dunking it in water dunking it in brine or quenching it dunking it in oil that is what's known as quenching so this rapid cooling process is what's known as quenching so what happens as it crosses that transformation temperature by quenching well what happens is that the carbon doesn't get to migrate or diffuse the way it normally would you don't get to form the perlite or it doesn't go to the grain boundaries as it normally have would have gone and instead it gets trapped within the structure of the iron and you form another material known as martensite so this martensite is the result of heating a iron above a certain content of iron above the transformation temperature and cooling it or causing it to cool down quicker or quenching it before the entire diffusion or the normal migration of the carbon can take place this actually causes the space lattice to become distorted because it's not supposed to hold this much carbon the material actually becomes more brittle and it becomes very very hard 
And this is one of the issues people have when they try to do welding on certain types of steel. You know, low carbon steel, you don't really have to worry about doing any extra precautions when, you know, as a way to avoid martensite. With high carbon steel, however, there, this is the reason that it's oftentimes preheated before the welding process takes place, is to avoid having this migration or this rapid cooling take place outside of the heat effect zone, which would be another video. But it's to avoid or controlling how fast this material actually cools down because you want to avoid this very hard, very uh, uh, brittle material called martensite, which, you know, in the, the negative sense can actually be, you know, have a very detrimental impact on your welding. Now, I want to close this video out with something very important. So we've looked at the temperature versus the carbon, carbon content, and we've talked about a little, a little bit about this transformation temperature and the effects of carbon content that it has on the, the mechanical properties of iron. And that takes us to something called this picture, which is a, known as a phase diagram. You know, this phase diagram, all it does is it talks about or it shows you the different levels of carbon by weight versus the temperature. And it shows you all the different grades or different categories of iron and the different, you know, different zones that represent what will go on with that iron or go on with that iron based on the carbon content and the temperature that it, that it is. So it's a, a very good tool to understand what your what the kind of iron that you're working with is and what you can expect from it in terms of its application and its overall properties so if that video was helpful to you at all go ahead and subscribe to my channel i do videos on manufacturing as well as different engineering topics please share the video to anyone you think might be able to benefit from it so you can subscribe to me on youtube you can also follow me on Twitter, where I go through a lot of different uh, engineering and manufacturing topics up to date, talking about the skills gap and Industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution. You can also follow me on Google+. I have two fairly active communities. One is uh, Manufacturing Skills and Education, where I talk about, obviously, manufacturing and manufacturing skills, manufacturing technology. And I try to help people showcase their companies on that channel. And then there's the engineer's reference where I talk about general engineering activity, uh, a lot on automation, a lot on just like new technologies and different types of you know math applications and different things that engineering goes through. So another pretty active community. And, you know, anytime you see my little logo, the infinity, double infinity, you can know that I've gotten my presence there. Uh, again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.